You may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. Try to be a rainbow in someone else's cloud. Do not complain. Make every effort to change the things you do not like. If you cannot make a change, change the way you have been thinking. You might find a new solution. By Maya Angelou. Welcome to Know Your Fundamentals. My name is Kelly Berthold. I'm a licensed clinical social worker that created this accessible and attainable podcast series to provide the need to know what, why, and how foundations of mental wellness. It is first recommended that you listen to episodes in order and then return back to episodes in any order to refresh, practice, and gain deeper insight to support your empowerment. As a reminder, this first season is dedicated to what I believe are the need-to-know foundations of mental wellness and will be labeled as The Fundamentals. Disrupting mental health stigma while keeping the ethics, this podcast is for educational purposes only and in no way clinical advice. Check out our website, mindcastmedia.com, for additional content, resources, and more after this episode. You did it. You got through the three-parter episodes of balanced breathing and the autonomic nervous system. The hardest part of gaining a strong foundation is trying to take all the seemingly unrelated ingredients, putting them together, and then trying to experience through your own life experimentation of trial and error how they actually blend pretty well once they're combined and worked into each other. Imagine being around 14,000 years ago and deciding you were going to take a plant from the ground, mash it up with some water, let it heat up on a rock, and then eat it. But voila, bread. Cook it longer, toast. I can't begin to imagine the thousands of years of experimentation that were required to get food to where it is now in the 21st century. Today, you could be baking some cookies and just dumping some ingredients together. Okay, so maybe some of you who are actually good at baking wouldn't describe the process the same way I just did just now. But if you really took a moment to think of all the experimentation that was needed just to make flour, the innovation to make flour required experiential experimentation, and through that experimentation, undoubtedly full of plenty of failures and perseverance for hundreds, if not thousands of years, a foundational staple of our diet was created. Flour alone isn't a staple of our diets, but further experimentation allowed for the discovery that blending other foundational ingredients that, at first glance, would seem completely unrelated, like eggs, milk, salt, and sugar, can enhance not only our ability to digest something, but also enhances its flavor and our pleasure of the eating experience. And we're not stopping there. Consider that despite all the variation and consistencies and textures of those products, they somehow blend together and are staples for thousands, if not millions of different types of edible products that don't kill us, but actually nurture our bodies and often increase pleasure in our lives. In today's world, we don't have to think so deeply about those foundations or fundamentals of baking because they are well known and commonplace and are easily found in any recipe with a step-by-step process. What would the world be like if we could make mental health wellness as nonchalant and step-by-step as baking? Get the ingredients and put them together. We have already gone through thousands of years of trial and error when it comes to mental health and wellness and we are still very much experimenting with how to make bread when it comes to mental health and well-being. Like we all have different tastes, we all have different mental health needs, but the staples, the main ingredients needed are still largely the same across populations. Now, at this point in the podcast, you know pretty well some key aspects of how your brain and body work and how accepting our most basic functions of our biology have a really big impact on our lives. We have covered that understanding how these seemingly unrelated ingredients in our bodies, brains, and minds can work well together, can empower us to focus more on what works rather than linger or stew on what we don't have control of. Stew works really great for soup, but it isn't so great for our brains. 
You now have some basic tools to troubleshoot your own physiological software, or in the above analogy, your basic bread recipe. Think of your breath like you think of the flour required to build the dough. Alone, it's enough to sustain life partially, but in itself can enhance it. Combining it, though, with some other ingredients, experiment, give yourself space to fail, and it will help you enhance the flavor of your life. Let's play around with some other ingredients, shall we? I'll be your Julia Child, although at times it may feel more like Dan Aykroyd's impersonation. You can see the show notes for that SNL clip. Getting into our episode six outline, here enters the pyramid and the reason why there's a pyramid or triangle in the KYF logo. In this episode, we'll be starting to talk about our human hierarchy of needs using Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is known as a general staple in various fields, showing that certain human needs are often needed to be met well or well enough consistently in order to reach higher needs like human flourishing and self-actualization. We will primarily focus on reviewing and breaking down basic and safety needs, the bottom two tiers of the five-tiered pyramid. We're going to work our way through the hierarchy over the next few episodes and give you some guidance and directions of things you can do to support getting your most basic needs met so you can focus more of your time and energy on higher order needs. Spending less time just trying to survive means more time thriving. Spoiler alert, these needs don't have to be met perfectly if you struggle in any particular area. And I'm here to support you in getting all of your needs met because you're awesome, you matter, and doggone it, you deserve to be actualized. Now, I've had my share of Saturday Night Live and classic comedy Easter eggs in each episode, but I haven't been so discreet so far this episode, and I'm not going to stop now. The one with Stuart Smalley with Michael Jordan, so good. Also, you can find that one in the episode notes. I'm calling that one out, though, outright because self-affirmations are often seen as pseudo-psychology, but try not to care about how cheesy or dumb your stinking thinking negativity bias thinks it is. Try to do it anyway. Just do it. You'll be glad you did. Especially in a few more episodes, when I go into detail about all the good things you're doing for your brain, when you add a little smally into your thinking. Not to mention laughter and a sense of humor wields great health benefits for the brain and the body. I'll lay it down real thick soon for those with the most skeptical negativity biases, but we aren't there just yet to get into all those descriptions. Try to do a trust fall with this one and start early if you can. If you're on the other end of the spectrum and dislike most of the things I've been saying, but you're here still listening, that's okay. Keep on keeping on. One episode at a time. Like many things, the early stages are the hardest part, but once we have that flour kneaded into a nice dough, baby, we're golden. Okay, so our next stop shop is talking about our hierarchy of needs. All human beings need their physiological needs or our basic needs met in some way to function at all. Even if we can regulate our breathing, our body is going to be constantly gearing itself towards fight or flight or freeze if we can't get our most basic needs met. So what are the basic needs of people? We are going to utilize American psychologist Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs for this next part of our series, as it's a pretty useful conceptual tool to recognize what we do in fact need to establish for ourselves to survive, which will then increase our ability to thrive. The brain and body of any creature is built to put survival ahead of thriving. As I often say, surviving is a must, thriving is a perk. From our last episode, we discussed the autonomic nervous system and how we are built to be more reactive than proactive. And that's because our body recognizes the need first and foremost to avoid, escape, and ward off danger. We also review that building a strong foundation is paramount to being empowered. And understanding our basic biological needs goes hand in hand in strengthening our competency and confidence in knowing ourselves. Looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the first thing we need to build up from the base of the pyramid is our basic needs. That is what is necessary for life to even exist at all. Next comes the safety needs, that of which is necessary to sustain life. Then we get to higher needs like love and belonging needs, which are being able to connect with others and the self and feeling connected to our world and community. Next comes our esteem needs or confidence in ourselves and our own abilities. And then at the very tippy top, what we all hope for in our own lives, 
self-actualization, self-fulfillment, or human flourishing to be our true authentic self and reach and live out our unique potential in whatever way is important to us as individuals. Starting at the foundation of the pyramid at basic physiological needs, we must have food, water, air, and shelter to survive. Food that is nutritious, that actually has nutrients, vitamins, minerals, healthy fats, and proteins. It isn't full of empty calories. Water that is clean, free of illness-causing pollutants and doesn't make us sick. Air that is equally clean and doesn't make us sick. And shelter that can protect us from the elements. For some of us, we don't need to think too much about these needs at all. Our basic needs may be easily met and we may even be able to afford things like quality nutritious foods and our bodies don't reject certain food products due to allergies or other health conditions. And we live in areas that have easily accessible grocery stores with produce and fresh products. That is the opposite of what is known as a food desert where grocery stores are challenging to access or have fewer nutritious options. We may find that we have sustainable income and money to pay our mortgages or rent and utilities, can go shopping for weather-appropriate clothing, have beds and garments to support quality sleep, and live in areas that aren't polluting our land, water systems, and air. So let's stop a moment to recognize how food security and access to nutritional foods, clean water, safe unpolluted air, safe places to live and rest, the ability to have restorative seven to nine hours of sleep, Clean clothing that's suitable for the elements are basic needs to survive. And that so many people nationally and internationally struggle in today's world to access these most basic elements of life. Coming back to our flour and bread analogy, if you can get all these needs met pretty consistently, you can nonchalantly go to the store, get your ingredients, bake without stressing about the cost, time, or energy that goes into those ingredients, that allows your brain and body to more easily focus on higher needs. If any of these factors are challenging for any reason, though, the brain may have a difficult time focusing on higher needs because it's stressing about how to obtain and sustain basic survival needs to live. Now, let's consider how hard it may also be for many people in the world to have their safety needs met. Safety needs are a desire for freedom from illness or danger and for secure, familiar, and predictable environments. To have a freedom to obtain and receive medical and health-related services, including mental, emotional, social, physical services, if ill or in need, and to feel secure, heard, and able to collaborate in that care. To have your own individual family, community resources available to you, and to feel secure in the reliability of those services. To have security in a familiar and predictable environment that doesn't feel like something terrible could happen at any instant. Per a 2017 World Health Organization report, quote, at least half of the world's population cannot obtain essential health services. And each year, large numbers of households are being pushed into poverty because they must pay for health care out of their own pockets. For almost 100 million people, these expenses are high enough to push them into extreme poverty, forcing them to survive on just $1.90 or less a day in U.S. dollars. I think it's reasonable to say that if half of the world's population cannot obtain essential health services and more and more people every year are being pushed into poverty, that gives us a pretty good idea of how many people struggle to get their basic needs and safety needs met. Your mind may also be considering all the other challenges our world faces that impact people's basic and safety needs. So if any of these things apply to you, you are not alone. Undeniably, we can see that when any of these basic and safety needs aren't met, this can spell trouble not only for our own well-being, but also for others and our communities. Being mindful and successfully shifting from automatic to proactive manual processes is more challenging when any of these basic needs are off because our brain and bodies as organisms on this planet have fundamental basic and safety needs. Those automatic and reactive processes in ourselves pull harder for control because our physiology argues that it needs to focus on surviving and can make it challenging to balance ourselves, let alone focus on longer term wants and goals, which are often tied to our higher order needs on the pyramid. When more of or all of our basic and safety needs are met, we are more easily able to utilize proactive mental functions like mindfulness. We can even think of it in terms of calories, 
literally. Because of survival needs, our brain wants us to use what requires the least amount of caloric energy. Reactive and automatic processes require less caloric energy because they are designed to fix something as soon as possible and with the least amount of caloric input possible. Consequences be darned. When it comes to some of our reactive automatic processes, our brain responds with, from the moment that stimulus hits me, I have one moment countdown until this dynamite in front of me is going to blow. So don't you dare take time to think. Just trust your instinct and go, man, go! Then you act on that reactive impulse urge, only to recognize later that sometime, even as soon as the next moment, that your reaction, in fact, was the dynamite that blew up, not the situation. Throw in a MacGruber meme here. Yeah, I'm on a roll when it comes to SNL, apparently, this episode. Again, you can find that clip in the episode notes. So yeah, great. More mess to clean up and be stressed over. Awesome. Yes, because our bodies want to be calorically efficient to ward off ultimate threat of death, it can be challenging, to say the least, to pull away from those automatic, reactive, mental, emotional, and physical processes. There are three things that are common in reactive processes when it comes to our bodies wanting to get out of pain or discomfort. One, our body is attempting to convince us there's a lot at stake if we don't just bend to that urge or desire. So it's not uncommon that the discomfort or pain will actually increase, including emotional pain or discomfort, not just physically, as a call to action. Feel me, see me, do something about me, now, fast. You can't take this. Danger, Will Robinson, danger. Two, our reactive bodies and brains want to feel better immediately. And so if there's something that seems obvious, that we know will make us feel better, even if it's just for the moment or just for the short term, if it's something that doesn't expend a lot of energy to do, it's harder to fight off those urges to indulge in quick relief or pleasure as well. Our bodies care about conserving calories and energy. It's not uncommon that when we're under high stress, the body may want to rest, go to sleep, get distance from something, eat high caloric comfort foods. It takes calories, mental and physical, to do something that has more prolonged health benefits, like meditation, going on a walk, talking to a friend, writing in a journal. Don't feel bad if those proactive long-term behaviors are harder to do. It's not a character flaw. And the more burnout you are, and the less you have your basic and survival needs met, it makes it that more challenging because you have less extra caloric reserves to pull from, which makes it that much harder to convince your body to consider higher order needs like thinking and behaving because it requires more caloric energy to do those things. Three, your brain and body will literally try to convince you to do the easier, more calorically efficient thing that has potentially less health benefits than the harder thing that is likely to be better for you in the short term and long term. It does this by easing what is called cognitive dissonance. This is when your brain doesn't like that you feel bad about the solutions that are easier or more habitual to choose. So it sends out thoughts to support the argument of doing the thing that it wants you to do. It's been a long day. I know I'd feel better if I worked out, but I'll try again tomorrow and I, I'll have a beer tonight. It's a light beer. I'll just have one. I know I'd feel better if I went to bed right now, but I never get to have any time to myself and I just want to zone out a bit longer and scroll. Don't ask for help. You don't know for sure that they're going to say yes. It's too stressful considering the possibility of them saying no. So just deal with it. I already have for this long. We all know sometimes the fastest solutions aren't always the best long term, but our autopilot is very good at putting a spin on things to make the easier solution seem like the best option initially at first glance and also plays it on surround sound. In times when we're experiencing fear, hunger, sleep deprivation, mental, emotional, social, and physical fatigue, long term goals and solutions are up against the reactive current struggling to get a vote in in any direction and just trying to keep the raft afloat. This is especially true for those who go through frequent or consistent hardship in getting basic and safety needs met. So we get hangry when we're hungry. We get snippy when we're tired. We have a harder time resisting texting back in a rage when we think someone has done us wrong, or our thoughts and worries race with the volume of a metal concert, thinking about the worst possible scenarios. 
When we have to spend so much time and energy just to get our basic and safety needs met, we're deprived of opportunities to feel more connected with ourselves, others, and the world around us. Those opportunities to connect more deeply to ourselves and the world around us are more functional and easier to tap into when we have our basic and safety needs met. The more those needs are met consistently, the more we have energy to invest in higher order needs. We can't spend energy on thriving if we don't have energy to survive. Money analogies work very well when it comes to considering health, wellness, and prosperity. You can't spend money to invest in your dream career if you don't have money to pay for food or housing. It's really hard to get involved in the community and give all of what you have to offer when you don't feel you have enough time and energy to take care of yourself. Systemic poverty has a big impact not just on our community and economic health, but also more directly related to this podcast, mental health. If you have enough money, safety and basic stressors go away, and you can focus on investing that wealth, which increases the likelihood of exponentially increasing wealth and decreasing the likelihood that basic and safety stressors will come back, or if they do, will not be as long-lasting. Now, I'll reframe that sentence with energy. If you have enough physical and psychological energy, safety and basic stressors go away, and you can focus on investing that energy, which increases the likelihood of exponentially increasing thriving and decreasing the likelihood that basic and safety stressors will come back, or if they do, they will not be as long-lasting. I'm talking holistic energy, energy that comes from not being weighed down by stress and surviving. We spend a lot of money on fast-acting synthetic energy with stimulants, energy drinks, and quick dopamine boosts, which drive home those earlier points I made about fast relief. As Dolly Levi says in Hello Dolly, money is like manure. It's not worth a thing unless it's spread around, encouraging young things to grow. Energy like money needs to be invested in the self for us to grow. When we are prospering, we as a society share that energy with others so others can grow as well, while also tending to our own needs to maintain the security and energy. We can take care of the self, and when we have taken care of the self, it makes it easier for us to take care of others. Our bodies and brains may become hypervigilant, which is a state of being more cautious or watchful for possible danger. Hypervigilance may make it more difficult to see all the things that do exist in the present moment not just the possibility of danger. Now, this is a basic model. Not everything in our lives is dependent on one area being perfectly completed, as if a check mark is necessary to get to the next level. We are here to acknowledge and respectfully move away from black and white thinking and absolutes. So let's get to the dialectic. We first acknowledge the realities of our biology, reactions, basic and safety needs, and ways our bodies are primed to respond. Now we'll get to the and we aren't perfect machines and we don't need to be to thrive. Humans are resilient and strong bleepers and many titans in history and in today's world have been able to move mountains despite the challenges they face or have faced. What came after the Black Plague? The bleepin' bleepin' renaissance. We have always existed in dialectical societies where something pulls in one direction, we learn, adjust, and swing into the next. But the Renaissance was possible in Italy in the 1400s because of wealth and prosperity in the region. Less poverty and death meant more scientific and creative innovation, exploration, and prosperity. That comes from higher order thinking that's possible when you're not suffering from chronic loss of basic and safety needs. We need to identify what is wrong in ourselves and also our societies, to strengthen creative solutions to improve society and our own lives. People every moment of every day are overcoming barriers and obstacles and are using their superhuman abilities to improve their and others' lives for the better. And that doesn't mean that they deserved or needed to have gone through the hardship or level of hardship that they had gone through. So, hello, balance. Although not having our basic and safety needs met can make it more challenging to build beyond those areas of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we humans are complex and sophisticated in our abilities to overcome challenges and obstacles. Each of us as individuals have unique strengths and abilities, and some of the greatest strengths and abilities come through and are strengthened by adversity, failures, mistakes, and obstacles, and overcoming real or perceived threats. 
When those real or perceived threats are taking place and we approach them feeling confident, curious, and capable, and are willing rather than willful to build our competency, we acquire personal growth through those experiences. There's nothing wrong with failing. In fact, you may want to make it a point to do it at least 15% of the time per a study that I have listed in the notes. Being willing or open to all that exists in an experience, including facts that are real and perceived threats, can allow for opportunities for innovation. Whether you're in a situation you wanted or didn't want, looking within yourself to see how you can be innovative with the resources that you do have is flexing your mindfulness superpower. Through willingness to be present in facing challenging obstacles and seeing beyond initial reactive processes, we can set forth proactive habits of mindful awareness and choice that, when repeated, can strengthen and offer opportunity beyond being stuck or complacent and bring opportunities to thrive over survive. Focusing on what is in our control and letting go what is not. This may sound like it's passivity or approval, but actually being able to focus more clearly on the things that are within our control provides more opportunities for growth and change in ourselves and the world around us. Maya Angelou's quote is wisely communicating, wasting time on focusing on what is not in our control and our complaints prevents us from spending time, energy, and awareness of focusing instead on what is in our control. This doesn't mean we don't have complaints, thoughts, emotions, or physical sensations can't just be stopped from happening, including those initial complaints. It doesn't mean that those complaints don't have important information tied to them that are worth looking at. The question is, after I see and feel what I have a complaint with, what can I do about this complaint? When we can see more clearly beyond the hurdles of our willfulness to linger in the powerlessness of the complaint alone, we're able to see what is in our power to do about it. Rolling around in the complaint for hours or days isn't a solution. It's just lingering in the problem without moving to considering and acting on steps to resolution. It's through our awareness and acceptance of the message of the complaint, listening to what it has to say, we can choose to bring our minds to innovate solutions, problem solving, and even potentially letting go what we don't want to do anything about. Even that is a solution. Acceptance and approval sometimes are used interchangeably in the English language. Acceptance is accepting things in the world as they are in reality as they exist. That's all things that exist, not just what seems the most loud and attention drawing. That acceptance allows for the possibility of our minds to be able to focus on how we can and want to influence that reality. It has nothing to do with approval. Approval requires its own thought process and consideration. In the simple act of fostering an awareness of what is in my experience right now in this moment, to see where the mind may be going in this moment on autopilot, I can slow down with my breath and my senses smell, taste, touch, hearing, and seeing, to help me ground myself and decide what to do next. I can redirect my attention to what is in my control at this moment and attempt to focus on that. If the mind gets distracted, that's okay. The mind will get distracted constantly, as we had discussed in episode one. But a kind reminder. So whether we're running low on our basic needs, or if we have our basic needs and safety needs met consistently, we're still going to do the same three steps. As I have validated in most of the episode, if you have a harder time getting your basic and safety needs met now, or did in the past when you're growing up, these steps may be a little bit more challenging for you or a lot more challenging for you. It's not saying that they will be for everyone, but if they are for you, that's okay. You may be a person that has their safety and basic needs met all the time and always have, and it still may be hard for you too. And yes, that is also very possible and also okay. But no matter where you fall on the spectrum, the practice is the same. And I'll break it down for you in two parts. Part one, check the reality of your most basic needs. Name it to tame it. Are you tired? physically, mentally, or emotionally tired? If yes, label it. I am tired. Are you hungry or thirsty? If yes, label it. I am hungry. I am thirsty. 
Is there something else you need right now that you don't have? If yes, label it, identify it. I'm stressed about money for rent. I am worried about blank. Is there something that is a habit that makes you feel better in the moment and you also recognize may not be the healthiest choice? Attempt to label that as well and identify it. Are there healthy options? And maybe you want to attempt to increase the frequency that you do practice those healthy options. Name them, identify them, label them. Get them down on paper or in your notes on your phone or computer. Put them somewhere. You can identify them and come back to them. Part two, awareness, acceptance, and choice. Awareness of my needs, being aware and able to label my wants, awareness of what exists in reality. Write them out if you can. Again, get it out of your head and organize them on pieces of paper. See them. See them in front of you. Your needs, your wants, and what exists in reality for you to obtain your needs and your wants. Accept, this is how I'm feeling now. This is what I need now. This is what I want. This is how reality is right now. And then what is in my control? Choice. What behaviors, mental and emotional and physical behaviors, can I put into practice to do more of what is in my control to meet these needs? To meet these wants? Now, whether or not it's difficult to do those things, that's different. Right now, we're just focusing on what is in my control if I were to do any of these things. Breaking it down to the most simple of terms. What is in my control with my needs? What is in my control with my wants? What is in my control in the reality of the situation? What is not in my control in the reality of the situation as it pertains to my needs and my wants? Act on what is in your control. Make a step-by-step -step action of what you will do first for your needs, then for your wants, and for what is in your control in the short term and long term of a situation. This may include asking or getting help from others and resources available. Attempt to act on accepting what is out of your control and letting it go. When the mind overthinks or ruminates and focuses on what is out of your control and is truly out of your control, once you catch that is where your mind is and you bring awareness to it, breathe it in and breathe it out. Be with it for a moment. Listen to what it has to say for a moment. Take in that information. Attempt to practice accepting that moment and then kindly, gently redirect your attention back again to the present moment and what is in your control in this new moment of time. Now, these steps will be available in a document on the website. Remember, the more we practice anything, the better we can get. These practices may feel really challenging at first, but with repetition, consistency, and frequency, it will get easier with time. Just like kneading that dough, it gets easier and smoother with time and practice and repetition. With repetition and practice, you'll be focusing more on doing what works both for the short term and the long term, and that may help increase opportunities for getting basic safety and other needs met which opens up more opportunities for long-term goals and thriving. Fear and all of those fun adjectives that connect to fear, insecurity, concern of judgments from others, failure, what ifs, the unknown, the ultimate fear often, the unknown, rejection, are our brain's way of trying to protect us, but those overprotective walls often prevent us from getting to higher order needs and thriving. Practice labeling those fears, see them, accept them, be with them, listen to them. You already are. Push them over by walking through them and do what you're afraid of doing anyway, as long as that behavior is something that you believe to be true, is much more likely to be a benefit to you in the short term and long term than 
be a detriment. The more you practice breaking through fears that hold you back from your goals, the better you'll get at doing that. Those fears will no longer feel like they have to be as loud because your body begins to trust you through the process that you do actually know what you're doing. The United States is known for being a pull yourself up by the bootstraps type of society. We know the phrase, it takes a village. And this phrase often applies too to more than just raising children. It's not always that we live in the reality though of having the support of a village or access to a village or we behave on a faulty assumption that our village isn't open to actually being willing and wanting to help despite resources available. But if there are resources available to you and people who are wanting to spread their metaphorical manure all over you to help you grow, let's share some poop. Ask for help when you need it. Trust yourself that you'll be able to do things on your own when you don't. It's not a sign of weakness asking for help. You know that. Deep, deep down, maybe a part of you does know that already. But dang, it's still hard to ask. Get vulnerable. Get real. Get genuine. By seeking help and support when you need it and focusing on what can improve your life, that shapes a world for the better, not for the worse. Despite what your stinking thinking negativity bias likes to think. We can't alone cure all of what plagues the world in our lives. But by taking a moment to check in with ourselves, tap into our breath, and connect to ourselves mindfully, even in difficult times, even when it feels very challenging to do so, we can increase the possibility of seeing beyond the reactive, habitual processes. For all of those who struggle to get any of your needs met or met consistently, or wherever you fall in the pyramid, what you already learned from the last episode awareness, acceptance, and seeing perspectives outside of our initial reactions can be power when it comes to choice and opportunity. Although it's more challenging to practice mindfulness if we feel we're under threat or one or many of our needs aren't met, taking a moment to check in with ourselves is a tool in our mental utility belts. When we give mindfulness a chance, we can focus on the here and now and what is in our control. We can be more capable of acknowledging and letting go of what we do not have control of so we can focus more on what we do. Slowing down our breath can help us slow down our minds. It grounds us. It allows us to be anchored to see what all is going on. And when we can see all the reality of what is going on around us and inside of us, it helps us further harness more of this mindful mental ability and decide how to proceed. Being able to check in with ourselves, to bring awareness to our lives and what we may need can help us check in to figure out what is missing for us to thrive and improve our well-being. We don't have control of all the things in the world that make our lives and the lives of others more difficult. And let's take a breath and think about choices we can make to help our lives and the lives of others. We want to be aware that we all face our own struggles. All struggles are valid. They're coming from somewhere. They are difficult for each and every one of us. And not everyone struggles equally. Being able to identify our own challenges, acknowledging when something is too overwhelming, too painful, too difficult, or when the load is too heavy. Seek help and support. We can't do everything on our own. We need each other. And sometimes we need a little or a lot of help. And that's okay. Let's be curious kind, and non-judgmental. Empowerment comes one breath and conscious, intentional choice at a time. Moving on now to our episode six practice, Responsive Breathing Space. This is another adaptation from a Center for Mindfulness Studies Meditation, Three Minute Breathing Space. Again, this app can be downloaded for free to access its meditations. You can find this adaptation and my meditation adaptations on mindcastmedia.com. In this practice, we're going to continue doing what we already have been practicing, being aware of our breath, attempting to be present and be in the moment, and when we ultimately and inevitably get distracted, kindly and gently redirecting our attention back again to where we want it to be, which is, for the purpose of this meditation, bringing your attention back to the guided practice. What we're going to be adding to this practice is a difficulty. 
I'll guide you in asking you to bring to mind a difficult but manageable experience. Please meet yourself somewhere that feels even slightly uncomfortable but not intolerable as you balance your window of tolerance with the experience. If very upsetting and intolerable thoughts, emotions, and memories arise that threaten to throw you out of your window of tolerance, attempt to open your eyes if they're closed to see if it may help you focus on a more manageable difficulty. If this doesn't help, you can focus your attention on a physical sensation such as the breath, hands, where you're planted on the earth, such as your feet or your bum. You could focus on singing, maybe twinkle, twinkle, little star in your head or out loud. You could hum or do another activity that feels safe and helps you get back into your window. Building mastery in something requires exposure to an experience. And it doesn't mean we need to cannonball into liquid hot magma. We'll talk about trudging and allowing in the future. For now, I'll give you a little sprinkle. Trudging is moving forward while you're shackled by a five-ton weight of holding on to all the things we don't have control of. Willfulness, emotions, suffering, writhing in the pain, and letting it hold us down, rather than acknowledging it and seeing what the messages are, that they're not, in fact, boulders, but are actually clouds of information. Allowing is a willingness to be with the experience to be with the clouds without it holding us down. They float beside us, the emotions, the memories, the information, even the pain. That's existing with a difficult experience, still feeling it and navigating with it rather than trying to force through it or against it. Through this meditation practice, this may be an opportunity to think about and be curious about basic needs and difficulties in getting basic needs met and met consistently. Or when in our lives may make it more challenging to have basic needs met. You may also be curious about safety needs, love and belonging, esteem, or self-actualization needs. What we want to attempt to do here is to be present with what information our brains and bodies may be communicating if something is off somewhere in our lives and to see more clearly what is not in our control and, most importantly, what is in our control to do something about it. Seeing this all with a non-judgmental curiosity rather than getting carried away by the emotion of it. Allowing the emotion, seeing the information and being with it. If you're trudging through intolerable situations, it can make it more challenging. Start small. Take baby steps. Give yourself an opportunity to float in the water with your floaties. You don't need to jump into the lava. Listen to what your brain and body have to say rather than jumping into the emotional car that's about to do a Thelma and Louise cliff dive. Do first something that feels a little uncomfortable and work your way up. And if you need help and support, seek it out. Please observe your own needs and do not do practices that do not feel right for you. You're the expert on you. Do what works for you. As a reminder, practices will always be led and reflected on in the podcast episode. These recordings, variations of these recordings, extended practices, and other guided practices can be found on the mindcastmedia.com website. This will be labeled as Episode 6 Practice, Responsive Breathing Space. If at any time any aspect of the experience feels too uncomfortable or overwhelming, please respect your WOT. If your eyes are closed, open them and consider a proactive activity that can support returning to your window of tolerance or using the episode one window of tolerance grounding exercises podcast recordings. Distraction in the mind wandering is inevitable and natural. The practice isn't attempting necessarily to sustain attention, but is actually the practice of noticing where your mind is, existing with it, and then choosing where you want it to be in the next moment, over and over and over again. If you're present for half of a moment before you get distracted, that's okay. If you're recognizing you've been distracted for several minutes, that's okay. Just notice where your mind is in that moment, accept it, and direct your attention back again to where you would like it to be. Now settling into our responsive breathing space practice. Getting settled, sit in a position with feet flat on the floor, back straight but comfortable, and hands open either towards the ceiling or in your lap. 
For this exercise, it is recommended not to cross any body parts, but instead have an open posture. Closing your eyes, relax your forehead, cheeks, jaw and shoulders. If you feel at any point you need to open your eyes, please do so and adopt a soft gaze focusing on a point in front of you you can comfortably sustain. Settling into a comfortable yet alert sitting position and bring your attention to the body and the space it's in, becoming aware of your posture, the front of the body, the back of the body, and everything in between. Now bringing your awareness to noticing physical sensations by focusing your attention on the sensations of touch, contact and pressure in the body where it makes contact with the floor or with whatever you're sitting on. Take a few breaths here that are natural and relaxed. Allow the abdomen to relax and notice the breath for a few moments in the belly, the chest, the nose or the throat. Whatever you choose, Focus your attention here. Whatever you choose, focus your attention there in one of these areas for a few breaths. Bring to mind a difficult situation that maybe you worry or concern that is manageable in this moment that the mind can comfortably focus on with a slight discomfort. If there's a situation that feels more pressing and prompts additional discomfort, you are welcome to navigate this as well. Trust yourself to find one situation for this exercise. Bring the situation and concern to your full awareness and breathe in and out of it, seeing it in front of you and existing with it with each breath. I'm doing this for a few moments now. If you notice that the mind may be ruminating negatively or going down the rabbit hole of judgments of the worry or concern, attempt to be aware of this distraction and then kindly, gently redirect your attention back again to a more non judgmental, curious, and detached perspective. Using the breath as an anchor to bring yourself back. If you notice an emotion, attempt to label and name the emotion. Anger is here, sadness, fatigue, worry, 
Maybe multiple emotions exist. See them as they are and allowing them to be just as they are. Noticing any physical sensations that arise with the situation, labeling them and noticing, breathing them in and out. Next, noticing thoughts associated with the situation, worry or concern. Attempt to see those thoughts as if they are a screen in front of you. Acknowledge them. This is a moment of distress, discomfort, emptiness, pain. Whatever it may be, even if nothing occurs at all, let me feel this way. It's okay, whatever it is. I can exist with this too. I already am. It's already here. I can be with this. If what you're experiencing is particularly challenging, attempt to note that. Make some very intentional breaths here with longer exhales and what feels most difficult. Expanding to the mental, emotional, or physical sensations of the experience in the in-breath. And releasing or relaxing out of them with the out breath. Stay with these sensations for as long as they capture your attention. When you're ready, letting go of attending to the sensations of the brain and the body and return the attention to the lower abdomen, being with the body and breath here in this moment, and focusing on that, in and out. Bring your attention now to your full body, from the top of the head down to your feet. Now opening the eyes. Attempt to bring this more spacious awareness into the next moments of your life. Next, to get into our reflection. Were there any particular times where it felt challenging? Are you able to label the different types of sensations that you experienced that felt the most challenging? 
what happened next with those sensations. And then what happened? And then what happened? Were the challenging feelings permanent or impermanent? What sensations did you notice the least? What may be the effect of attending in this way? How might this attending be helpful or useful for you? The living life practice for this episode will be attempting to identify a goal to meeting a basic need. Consider if there are manageable and attainable ways to mindfully attend to that need more in your daily life and in a way that is kind, non-judgmental, and curious about meeting that need. See if you can identify one need that is manageable and attainable to build confidence in and write down how you may be able to achieve that goal on a daily basis. Then, attempt to schedule or set alarms for yourself to meet that goal. When you think of this difficulty or other difficulties, attempt to see them non-judgmentally as you attempted to practice with the responsive breathing exercise. Breathe into it and out of it, and keep using that responsive breathing technique and meditation to explore those discomforts. Relate to them differently with a broader perspective, and build awareness of what is in your control in those moments including existing with whatever comes up just as it is, balancing acceptance and change. For the breakdown of these tools, please go to the mindcastmedia.com website under resources to find links to content, other resources, and tools. In this episode, we discuss a general overview of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and general basic needs of our day-to-day lives. Our bodies care more about surviving than thriving, and we want to practice an awareness and acceptance of these basic parts of our humanity so we can focus more on what works rather than lingering and all that doesn't. Being kind with ourselves as we practice being with our experiences and whatever exists is an act of empathy for ourselves. As if we were sitting under a rain cloud with a friend, peer, family member, pet, if they were struggling, we can also do that with ourselves, our thoughts, our emotions, physical sensations, and everything our bodies and brains communicate to us. Life isn't perfect and it won't be that way, unfortunately, anytime soon. We may not get all of our needs met or met perfectly all of the time. And we can exist in an imperfect world and thrive anyway. You already are existing. So let's take some manageable baby steps, building mastery towards aspects of our lives we want more of for ourselves. We are worth it. Befriend your stinking thinking. Listen to what it has to say. And you don't have to behave off of it all of the time or even listen to all of it all the time. Do what works for you. I hope this podcast serves you well. And if you have the means to support, please visit mindcastmedia.com to see the ways that you may be able to support the podcast and media content that can continue to spread foundational wellness information across communities, nationally and internationally. On mindcastmedia.com, you can connect with us for any other questions, comments, donation, merchandise, resources, premium content, and more. Be a part of the Mindcast mission so we can focus more on what matters, the access of fundamental information to everyone. Your financial support can help Know Your Fundamentals become bigger and better. Podcast is one medium, but let's try to get this to as many people as we possibly can. See our show notes for info, citations, and resources. You can follow us at Know Your Fundamentals on Facebook, Threads, TikTok, Instagram, KY Fundamentals on X, and Know Your Fundamentals podcast on YouTube. Our Spotify Know Your Fundamentals playlist with over 15 hours of positive, upbeat songs across eras can also be found on the mindcastmedia.com website. You can get this podcast wherever you get your podcasts, as well as YouTube and Spotify with video, audio, and subtitles. And don't forget... Whatever your struggles, we're all much the same and we are all different with unique abilities and needs. No matter what, you are awesome just the way you are. Take care.